As a kid growing up, there, there were at least two deep convictions that I believe right down to the very core. So you ready for them? The first conviction that I had in my mind, the first belief that I knew right down to the very core, first of all, Santa is coming. Okay? Y'all thought it was going to be something deep, didn't you? Like something theological or philosophical or something? No, it was John. Uh, Santa is coming. So like every year, I believe this, every year like a clockwork, Santa's going to be here and he's going to leave presents underneath my tree and it's going to be a wonderful time for all. And so this led me to my second uh, conviction, which, which was summarized by the old song. You may remember it. I better watch out. I better not cry. I better not pat. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. And I knew the verse to be true too, that He sees me when I'm sleeping and He knows when I'm awake and He knows when I've been bad or good, so I better be good for goodness sake. As a kid, I believed that with everything in me. Anyone else with me? Just about all of us. We had that deep conviction. It was like Santa's coming, so man, I better get my act together, right? What we thought, we believed it so much that it changed everything about how we acted. Whenever I think about the fact that Santa is watching me at all times uh, and, and that he's going to deliver presents to me based upon how he saw me acting, man, I'd straighten up in a minute. Like this little Johnny was going to be a good boy if Santa's going to be watching. And if I ever got out of line, all mom and dad have to do is say what? Santa's watching you. Work on you guys too? Yeah, Santa's watching. You better act right. Santa's watching. Boy, I'd straighten up. I'd look like I was right there with the military. I mean, right, right in line, like ready to go, ready to do whatever you know was going on. What I needed to do. But of course, that reminder didn't work all year long, did it? I mean, you could only get away with using that as a parent for a reminder, and it would only work on you, typically speaking, around November and December. Your parents probably never tried using it during the first three quarters of the year because I imagine it typically wouldn't work. I think there's a reason for it. You see, in November and December, Christmas is fast approaching and like everything that's going on in Christmas is right there in front of our minds. So we go out into the community, we see decorations with the idea of Santa. We turn on the TV, Santa's plastered on the TV. I mean, we, we go to school, they're talking about the fact that Santa is coming. Like Everything that's going on in November and December, we, we start being reminded, especially after Thanksgiving, we start being reminded of the fact that Santa Claus is coming. So we better watch out, we better not cry, better not pout, and we're telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. Like we were reminded of this. But come December 26th, all the way up into Halloween, it was so far off in the distance that it had a little effect on our lives. Someone could have told me, my mom and dad could have told me in January, you need to be a good boy because Santa is watching. I'm like, well, he already came like a month ago, so I've got a while to live. Right? Let's be honest. So I'd act out, I mean, I'd straighten up for other reasons if, if that didn't work, but, 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 but like the idea of Santa Claus coming had little effect because it was so far off in the distance. But the closer I got to Christmas, the more I got my life in shape. The further away I was from it, the less I was concerned. Santa might forget what I did in March. But in November, December, he'll, he'll, he'll remember that one. And as I think about how we approach Santa as children, I can't help but wonder if that's how we sometimes approach the return of Christ. You see, as Christians, we know that He's coming back. And I don't know if you've noticed it on, on the screen up here before uh, but during communion, but, but it was Christ saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, we didn't cor correlate that, by the way. That's, that's God's working right there. It's pretty neat. But He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back to get you. Like we know that Christ is coming back at some point or another. We know that. But at times it feels like as if Jesus is coming on December 25th and it feels like we are living in the month of May with time to spare. As if it's so far off that we don't think about it or concern ourselves about it. And yet, if we ever stay on the lookout for Santa, if we ever you know, got our life together because Santa is watching and He's going to judge us by our actions by giving us presents or less presents or coal or whatever it might be, if we ever thought that way about Santa Claus, 
Do we have much more reason to watch for Jesus, to expect Jesus, and to act in the will of Jesus? Because when He returns, it's not going to be presence and coal. It's going to be eternity that lay in the balance. And that's what Jesus addresses in this parable that we read this morning in Luke chapter 12. The parable immediately follows what we talked about last week. If you weren't here last week, what we, 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 we looked at the parable of the, um, I believe it was the rich fool, wasn't I can't remember the title of it. But anyways, we talked first about, about seeking first the kingdom, right? We talked about seeking the kingdom of God. Don't be anxious for the things of this life. Don't be like chasing after all the things that this world has to offer. We talked about seeking the kingdom of God. Seeking Him. And what happens is immediately after Jesus gives that, He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Immediately after He says that, He goes straight into this parable about His return. There's not a break in the action. There's not like a question that, spur, that, that spurs it on. There's, not, there's nothing that, that He doesn't move from one town to another and begin teaching again. Immediately saying, for where your, my, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus goes immediately straight in to this talk about when He returns. So there's a correlation here. How we live our life now directly affects the life to come. How we live our life now directly affects the life to come. So as we continue our series this morning, parables more than stories, having told us to seek God's kingdom, Jesus says this beginning in verse 35. He says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. He says, truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those Servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. That the parable that doesn't really look like the parables that we've seen thus far, that this, this, the parables we've seen thus far are kind of being these elongated stories with a, with a clear picture, you know, this unified picture throughout the entire story, one story. This teaching is, is basically kind of two parables that are told together basically from two different angles that all lead up to the same point. So that's how we're going to break them down this morning. There's two parables in here that are slapped into one. We're going to break them down and then bring them together. The first parable pictures a servant who's waiting for his master to return from a wedding. Now in a time where we don't have cell phones and the master can't say, hey, you know, I'm turning on to Boggs. I'll be there in like three seconds. Uh, like the, 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 the servant wouldn't know exactly when the master would return. He would have an approximate idea because the master would say, you know, I'll be back around this time period. But he would never know the exact time that the master would return. There was no ETA kind of thing like, our, like your GPS will tell you exact uh, time. There was nothing like that in this time. We know that. But, but all, this master, all this servant knew was that his master had gone to a wedding. And weddings that time period, Jewish weddings would last several days. And then the master will return at some point. And even if the master returns in the middle of the night, the servant is supposed to be is expected to be ready to serve him. So the servant would, would do three things to be ready at all times. Not knowing exactly when the master will return, he would do three things to be ready at all times. First of all, he would stay dressed for action. And you may, your Bibles may say, gird, stay, uh, keep your, your, your loins girded. Uh, you've heard the phrase at some point, I'm sure, loin your, uh, gird your loins. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, anyways, that, that's the more literal phrase that, that, that's given here. And it's kind of this picture, we, we, we've had it in, in today's culture, that, well, back when we used to wear long sleeves all the time, you, that you roll up your shirt sleeves and get, and get ready for work, like you don't you want to pull them up. That, that's kind of the idea that we're, that we're seeing here. So, so in, in this time period, we, when, when servants would wear, or anybody would wear these long robes, the robes would kind of get in the way. They would restrict your movement. So if, if someone was going into battle, if someone was going to be working and serving someone, they didn't want the robe to get in the way. So what they would do is they'd tie it up in their waistband so they can move freely and work. 
And so this, this uh, servant is supposed to keep his, uh, his, his robe tied up at all times, ready for action at any given moment in case his, uh, his master returns. So, so if his master returns in the middle of the night, his loins are girded, he's his stayed dressed for action, he's ready to serve at that very moment. Second thing they would do is to keep their lamps lit. In a time without electricity, this meant that you had to keep the oil burning and the lamps outside. And, and this served a pretty good purpose. If the master came at night, this would allow the servant to be able to see if, if this is his master or if it's somebody else, maybe someone they don't really want in. So with the lamps always burning, the master comes up there, knocks on the door. The guy says, yep, that's my master. Opens up the door, lets him in. And the third thing is simply I mean, waiting, watching for the master to return. It's staying awake. It's staying alert. You see, the servant's master wouldn't want to stand outside and keep knocking for very long. You had to do that at someone's house before? Just knock, you pound away. You start feeling like, like you're bothering them at that point. Anybody else been there? No? I went, one time I'll tell you this story. We, uh, we were going around here uh, in this neighborhood a few years ago. We had a cookout thing. had flyers to hand to them. And, uh, and we'd go around knocking on doors, and, and, and you could hear them sometimes rustling in there. You knock you know, maybe twice. And uh, there's one time I just went up there and I pressed the doorbell and Dave Moody was with me. And Dave goes, man, did you read the sign? And I said, no. And, and there's a sign there that said, baby's asleep, please don't ring doorbell. And, uh, and uh, man, them dogs, you thought that like they were going at it in there with one another. And uh, I don't even know if we left the flyer because at that point they probably, <laughs> they're probably not going to come. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it woke the baby or not, but it woke up the neighborhood. That has nothing to do with my sermon. Uh, just a story that I, that I remember along the way. Uh, read signs before you ring doorbells. They're, they're good. But anyways, the, the master wouldn't want to come and knock at the door. And he's had to bang on the door until the servant wakes up. Especially if the master's the one who just got married. Like if he's coming home with his bride, he doesn't want to wait around for you to come and, and wake up, come open up the door. Like he's going to want you to be awake, ready to open up the door at any moment that he arrives. Jesus takes all of this and He basically says, be like the good servant who is awaiting His master's return. He even says, blessed are those servants. And He takes it a step further, doesn't He? He doesn't just say, blessed are those servants. He says, when the, when the master gets home and finds his servants waiting, He says, He's going to have them recline at the table and He's going to put on His work, his work clothes and He's going to come and serve the servants Himself. Boy, isn't that a beautiful picture of what Christ will do for us? Serving us at the feast. But then He suddenly switches gears. He moves away from this idea of a master and a servant relationship to the idea of a, of a thief. And he says that if the master would have known at what time the thief was going to be coming, he would not have left his home to be broken into. And I don't know if you've ever had your house broken into, but if you have, I imagine the thief never gave you a heads up before he did it. It's, it's the darndest thing, but it's almost as if they don't want you to know they're coming over for a visit, isn't it? When I was in high school, I played basketball. Y'all know I played basketball, and we had games that are on regular days. Every Tuesday and either Friday or Saturday, we, we would have a ball game. And so everyone kind of knew who played. I mean, it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody, so everybody knows who's playing ball. And so, uh, and so we had games every Tuesday, every Friday or Saturday. And so we, had, we actually had our house get broken into one of those nights. While we were away, Mom and Dad were watching me play basketball, and I was on the court. Someone broke into our basement, he picked up a few things, and then he left the house. Didn't even lock the door on his way. I mean, how rude can you be? Like, like if you're going to let yourself in, at least lock the door as you're walking out at the back. But that's honestly how we found out someone broke in there. But he broke in, he got a few things, out the door, he went. It would have been nice if this guy would have gave us a call ahead of time. You know, on Tuesday morning, if he would have said, hey, you know what, I'm going to be there tonight around 8 o'clock, just a heads up, just want to let you know. Man, if he would have let us know about it, we would have been right there to welcome him right on in at 8 o'clock that night if he wanted to come over. But he never told us the time. So we were never expecting it. And because we weren't aware, because we weren't ready, because we weren't prepared for this, the thief broke in and he stole from our house. And Jesus points out that the unfortunate truth is that for many, Jesus' return will be just like that. Coming like a thief in the night with people who don't expect it, with people who are completely 
unprepared. Jesus takes these two imageries. He slaps them together. These two short parables, He slaps them together. One of a servant who was ready for his master and at any moment when the master gets there, he's ready to serve him. That's the good. And the other is of a homeowner who did expect such unwanted company. That's the bad. And all of this brings us to the ultimate point that Jesus is trying to make in verse 40. With these two image, images in mind, Jesus says, You also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You see, somewhere within these verses of 35 through 39, somewhere within these two pictures of a servant waiting for his master and someone who is at home and does not expect the thief coming, somewhere in this, we find ourselves. We're either the servant who is ready and waiting for the master to return, ready to get down and serve at any moment of the day or any moment of the night, ready to greet him with open arms no matter what time he comes, or we are the homeowners who never know when the thief is going to come. It will face great loss at the moment of his arrival. Either way, Jesus tells us he's coming back. Whether we're ready or not, Jesus is returning. And so He gives this command from a heart of deep love for people. Jesus says, be ready. Be ready when the Son of Man returns. Now I understand that this message is something we've likely heard again and again. Some of you have heard this message for years, maybe even decades. I can still remember the first time I ever heard this message and it kind of stuck with me. It was about 20 years ago. I was part of this little youth choir thing that would go around and we would sing at different churches at revivals and Sunday night gatherings and things like that. And So we had a revival just down the road from our church and we went there one night and we sung and the guy got up and preached, the guest guy, and then the main preacher got up there, the guy at the church, stood up there in front of everybody and he said, now I know you all have been, this is what he said, he said, I know you all have been hearing about this for years, I know we've been saying it, he said, I can remember that we've been saying it as far back as the 70s, we've been telling you that Jesus is coming soon, I know you've heard this message again and again and again, but I'm here to tell you today, I believe that He is coming soon, that He is coming any moment. And he said it with such conviction and such power and such boldness that, man, it scared me to death. I went home that night thinking, man, Jesus could come back this very night. That was 20 years ago. Beyond this preaching, this message of Christ is coming soon. He's been proclaimed for thousands of years, almost 2,000 years. Peter, Paul, the other apostles expected it in their lifetimes. They were telling folks, hey, He's coming soon. Get ready. Beyond that, preachers for thousands of years, centuries have been proclaiming Jesus is coming soon. And we've heard it, haven't we? If you've grown up in church, you've heard it again and again and again. Jesus is coming soon. You better get ready. We see on the signs that they're out in the fields as you drive down the road. Jesus is coming soon. Be ready. But because we've Heard it again and again for years, and it's not happened. Here's the warning. We almost grow numb to the idea. We almost grow numb to it. There's a temptation that says, you know what? He hasn't come yet, so I don't imagine he's going to come anytime sooner. At least I don't imagine he's going to come in my life either. But the truth is, we're closer today than we've ever been. And one day, Jesus will return. One day, He's coming back. We all want to know when. We all want to have that time frame with, like we have with Santa where we can get our life together because we know He's coming on this very day. We want to live it up in January through October, but boy, we, we want to know when November and December is getting here so we can get our lives together. But the truth is, there is no date. 
In fact, Matthew 24, verse 36 says this. Jesus said this. But concerning that day and that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven are serving God at all, at all hours of the day. Nor the Son. But the Father only. We want that Santa Claus date. The truth is, we're never going to have the date. And that's why Jesus says we have to be ready at all times. Prepared in every moment. In case that moment is today. And there's great reason for being ready, and Jesus addresses that next. Verse 41, Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for, us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over, over his household to give them a, their portion of food at, at, uh, at the proper time? He said, Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour he does not know. And will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did, and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him much will be required and from him to whom they entrusted they will demand the more. This section of, of Scripture, of teaching, is sparked by a question from Peter. And Peter's wanting to know, are, are you teaching this to everybody in the crowds around us? Or is this message for us alone? It's really one of Peter's probably better questions that he asks. And, uh, but, but, but Jesus never gives a direct answer, does He? We want Jesus to say it's for you, it's for everybody, but Jesus doesn't give a direct answer. But what He does do is He further emphasizes the truth that we all need to remember. That ready or not, He's coming. And when He does, this is the message, we will all be judged. And while Jesus suggests here in this passage that teachers, preachers, and ministers, etc. will be judged by a higher standard, the reality is that every one of us is going to receive a judgment based upon our lives. The idea that how we live our lives today will affect the life to come. And in the end, there's no gray area. There's no middle of the, of the road group. There's no, well, I was you know, kind of good, so I'm in this section here and split up. We'll, we'll be divided basically into two groups, the blessed, the punished, the faithful, the unfaithful, the obedient, the disobedient. As Jesus points out, the blessed are the servants who, who the Master finds serving when He returns. The blessed are the ones who are obedient to the Master. They're ready for Him whether their Master is returning today, tomorrow, weeks, or even years later. They stay dressed for action. Their lamps are always burning. And, and, and they're always awake, alert, watching for His return. They're so focused on the, kingdom, on the Master's kingdom that they're not worried about the kingdom today. They're, they're so focused on serving Him that they're not worried about accumulating in this world. And because of that, Jesus says that the Master will set the servant over all of his possessions. It's this wonderful picture of those who are ready for Christ's return. It's this wonderful picture that we will be heirs with Christ, that everything that is His will be ours. And so we say, you know what, forget about living it up in this life. Forget about seeing our kingdom here in, the today, in, in, in today's period, in our lifetimes now. Like, give me what God's got waiting for me on the other end. Stop seeking today. Let me seek tomorrow. That's back to last week's message. We're going to be heirs with Christ if we're ready for His return. But beginning in verse 45, Jesus points out the startling truth as He introduces, introduces the section on the unfaithful. Jesus says, But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day, and come on an hour he does not expect, or no. 
You see, there's a problem we face with waiting on the return of Jesus. We're not good at waiting, are we? Anybody in here think you're good at waiting? Yeah, we don't like it. We don't enjoy waiting. We don't welcome waiting. We don't like to wait. There's a reason that, that, that there are dozens of fast food restaurants here in Richmond. There's a reason that the microwave is being thrown into every apartment and every house that is built every day. And we mentioned it before, but the microwave, is the, I think, is the best picture of our impatience. Even while cooking food or heating food faster than it should ever be cooked or heated, we get impatient with waiting. Anybody been there? We get impatient. We get fidgety. You know, we, we, get, we get restless. When we stand in front of the microwave, like, are you going to hurry up? We, we're almost cheering on and saying, come on, come on, come on. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Hurry up. Yeah, I'm hungry. There we go. I, I agree with you. I'm hungry. Let's get this food in my belly. Definitely ain't got time to cook a full meal right now. Let's pop it in here. Let's get it done. We prompt it as if, as if our prompting is going to make a second pass by any faster. Let's go. Now, if we've ever been impatient with a microwave, with a timer that shows you exactly how much time you have left, how well do you think we do at waiting at the return of Jesus with no date given? You see, we're tempted to be just like this servant who says, my master is delayed in coming. It's been a while. Thought he'd be here. I guess it's going to be a while longer. You see, this, this servant began thinking this way. My master's delayed in coming. He's supposed to be here by now, but it's, it's going to be a while longer, I guess. And so once he started realizing he's, he's thinking he's not coming soon, he's, he, he began losing his focus as he waited on his master's return. And I want you to notice here that he, that he never said, you know what, my, my master isn't going to come at all. He still expected the return. There's no doubt of that. But because his master was delayed, he got tired with the waiting, and so he lost his sense of urgency. He began thinking he had plenty of time to get ready for his master, like it's going to be far off in the future. And so he started treating people poorly here in this life. He started self-indulging. He started living outside of his master's will, living in disobedience, living it up, so to speak. He began thinking, I'm living in January to October. I've got plenty of time. Until the unexpected moment when the master finally came. I know it's a story, but, it, but could you imagine if this was real life? Could you imagine the look on that servant's face when his master came walking down the road and saw how he was acting? Could you imagine the pit in his stomach that just dropped the moment he saw his master's face? Would have been dreadful. And yet, if we're not careful, this servant can be a picture of us. Having heard the message that Jesus is coming soon for years, we sometimes grow weary in the waiting as we talked about. We begin seeing it as something that's still far off in the distance, like it's May and we're waiting on Christmas. And when we do that, we lose our sense of urgency. We lose our urgency in acting of obedience, possibly even straying into disobedience. Warren Wiersbe put it like this. He says, once a believer starts to think his master is not coming back, or just even thinking that his master isn't coming back soon, his life begins to deteriorate. He says, our relationship with others depends on our relationship to the Lord. So if we stop looking for Him, we will stop loving His people. The motive for Christian life and service must be a desire to please the Lord and to be found faithful at His return. The fact is, this servant wasn't expecting the master to return anytime soon. And once he lost the urgency, he began living however he pleased. He began living for self, treating others poorly and self-indulging. Yet the master returned like a thief in the night, completely unexpected, and the servant's face impending doom. And from there, Jesus he kind of discussed several different scenarios of how much people knew and kind of the extremity of the punishment they received. And we can kind of look at, well, I'm in this group who maybe didn't know as much, so I won't be beaten as badly. The point is to try to figure out which one of the group we're in. The point is, there's two groups. There's one that's going to be punished no matter how severely it may be, and there's one who's going to go with the Master, be served with the Master. There's a judgment that is coming. 
So by giving us additional teaching, Jesus reinforces what He already told us in verse 40. We must be ready ourselves. For the Son of Man is returning at a day and hour we do not know. We must be ever watching, ever waiting for His return. Because it could come at any moment. And while we may have a date and time for, frame for Santa so we can get our act together, we're not granted such a date and such a time for the return of Christ. As we saw, the, Jesus doesn't even know the day. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be another thousand years. But what we do know is that when He returns, everyone will be judged. No one can escape it. The faithful who are ready will receive great blessings and it will be a day of, of, of unknown and infinite joy. It, like, it, there's a reason we don't have to fear the second coming if we're ready. Joy unknown. And yet the sad truth is that for many it will be a day of reckoning as the unfaithful will face the beginning of an infinite nightmare. I'm not trying to use this message this morning as a scare you straight kind of tactic to try to get us, you know, scare us back on the straight and narrow. I'm just trying to remind us of the words of Jesus. He is coming. And maybe very soon. And even if He doesn't come in our lifetimes, death could be approaching at any moment. It's no respecter of persons. Everyone who's died early was the one who thought, well, that won't happen to me. So we have to be ready at all times in case today is that day. The question is, how can we be ready for His return? Paul put it like this, gave these instructions in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8 and 11 through 14. He says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The full rewarding that we'll receive in heaven is nearer to us today than when we first believed. You see, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Three points of application showing how we can be ready for Christ's return. First of all, walk in love. Love people. Treat them as we want to be treated. For all the commandments that we see, the will of God is summed up in this one command. Paul says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we love our neighbors as we await Christ's return. Second of all, we repent of sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is. It doesn't matter if we have these degrees of, what's of, of, a, of, a, of a lighter sin or a more extreme sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is. The point is we don't want Jesus to return as we are indulging in sin. We don't want Him to return as we are just caught up in it. So live in such a way that if Jesus were to come at any moment, as if He were to come at our house at any moment, we wouldn't have to say, hold on just a second, let me put the things away. Hold on a second, let me turn off the TV. Hold on a second, let me do this, let me do that. Live in a way that when the Master comes, we're ready and waiting for Him at any time. Repent of sin, all sin. And third of all, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek first His kingdom. Seek to do His will. Seek Jesus with everything we are and everything we have, keeping our eyes fixed on Him. Looking to Him, expecting Him at all times. Living obediently to Him always. So that we'll be found ready and living in a way that's pleasing to our Lord, to our Master when He returns. Again, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. What we do know, the old hymn says really well. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. 
Many will meet their doom and trumpets will sound. All the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. There is coming a day of great separation. One to endless joy, the other to endless nightmare. So don't be the servant who thought he had time to get everything in order. Don't be caught thinking that Jesus is coming in December and we're just in the month of May or July. Don't let Jesus return be like a thief in the night to your home. But be ready for Christ's return at all times. Live as if it's December 24th every single day and Jesus is coming this day. Walk in love. Repent of sin daily. And put on Christ as you seek and you live for Him. Jesus is coming soon. So I have one question. I'll leave us with this one question. Are you ready?